So um, I am going to hopefully over the next uh, 30 minutes or so um, talk about a couple of um, uh, sort of resuscitation and critical care papers uh, that have been in some of the big journals uh, that you should all know about. And I don't I make any apologies for the fact that you may be aware of some of these, um, but they're so important. It's been a massive year for uh, resuscitation and critical care uh, research, and there's been some absolutely excellent stuff come out. So make no apologies for um, uh, talking about some stuff that you may have heard of there's a few things in there you might have not heard of as well and uh, they're all in areas that uh, you practice in looking at uh, uh, what you all do um, uh, that you practice in on a on a day-to-day -day basis um, so a quick thing about disclosures these are all related to my uh, research activity and uh, I have spent several weeks trawling the literature, so you don't have to, to make sure that you do know about all the papers that you need to know about. So I've got 40 minutes. Um, I've got eight papers in all, so that's five minutes of paper. So you'll realise that obviously we don't have much time to get into depth about them all, which is great. So I'm just going to give you the headlines. Um, if you're interested in any of these, I've put some QR codes in there so you can uh, scan the QR code and you can go directly to paper and have a read of them yourself if you want to. So, but it's really just a general overview, just trying to summarize them for you. And we're talking tonight uh, in the areas of airway, because I know everyone loves a bit of airway. Uh, a couple of papers on cardiac arrest. We're going to talk about sepsis, about uh, potential treatment for pneumonia. And I'm going to finish with a few trauma papers as well. So let's kick off with some airways. Right, so airways. So um, you're in the resuscitation room. Uh, this was me a few weeks ago, and uh, we're about to intubate a GCS3 patient uh, with my registrar, and I'm about to pick up the direct laryngoscope. Now, I, I've never used a video laryngoscope. I was trained on the direct. And uh, my registrar says to me, uh, shouldn't we be using the video laryngoscope? I think there's much better chances of getting a first pass of my tube. So let's look at the evidence. There has been a meta-analysis, and that means a overview of all papers that are out there that was published in 2015 that showed that there wasn't any evidence that using a video laryngoscope increased intubation success. However, there was a device trial which was published just two months ago, and this was a trial looking at direct laryngoscopy versus video laryngoscopy and was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So it was prospective, it was multi-center, it was non-blinded, so the clinicians knew which group the patient was in, and it was randomized. So you, 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 um, when the patient uh, was elected to go in the trial, neither the clinician or the patient had any um, chance of directing which group the patient was in, whether it's direct or, or video. There was a US study in EDs and ICUs. It was 2,000 critically ill patients, and they were randomized to video or uh, direct. And the importantly, the uh, procedure was performed by an EM resident or a critical care fellow, and they were looking at successful intubation on the first attempt. So what did the results show? So for the direct group, first attempt intubation is 70% and with the video, 85%. And this was significant. Now, a few things I uh, just want to talk about this paper. So for me, that's quite a low successful intubation on the first attempt. Certainly in our department, uh, we're certainly around about 90 95% on the first intubation attempt in the ED. Though this is, this is trainees, uh, it's got to be remembered. Um, and this is part of the paper as well, which I thought was very nice. So it's a heat map, basically, of over the on the bottom is the number of previous intubations you've performed previously. And on the left hand side, uh, it's the proportion that you have performed with the video versus direct. So for me, I've performed quite a few intubations uh, over my 20 year career, but I've never used a video laryngoscope. So I'll be on the bottom there, but right off on the right hand side of the screen. My trainee has performed uh, less intubations than me, but has much more experience using the video. So they'll be up on the top bit. And anything that's uh, red favours using the video laryngoscope and purple favouring the direct. So we can see from this that if you haven't performed a large number of intubations, then your chances of success 
and first pass intubation are high with the video laryngoscope. Whereas the more intubations that you do, the less that difference is. Now the trial was stopped before they got to 2000 patients because they already showed an effect. Um, and importantly, 21% of patients had a severe complication during intubation. Again, this is quite a large number. These are severe complications such as hypoxia and hypotension. Uh, so fairly high uh, complication rate. And also they excluded a lot of patients. So 26% were excluded. Um, so you have to ask yourself, worse, there's some patients that maybe they were anticipated to be difficult, that the supervisor or the consultant attending in, the, in the, the US decided that they wouldn't put the patient into the trial and they would use one or other, whether that was direct or whether that was video laryngoscope. So we're probably looking at a cohort where expected to be slightly easier. So to summarize, video seems to be better for straightforward intubations and um, if you haven't performed lots of intubations in the past, but as the more you do, the benefit of using the video seems to diminish. It's an excellent trial, I'm sure that will change our practice and certainly, uh, certainly advocates the benefits of the video device. So let's move on to some cardiac arrest research. I'm gonna talk about uh, eCPR, ECMO CPR. Um, so this is where patients who are um, uh, preferably pre-hospital, but also in hospital, who uh, we have yet to get ROSC back, um, who fit uh, in most cases a fairly uh, select criteria, are as quickly as possible moved either within the emergency department um, or through to a, a, a cardiac uh, catheter lab, for example, and put on um, extra corporeal membrane oxygenation. This is basically where we bypass the heart to provide oxygenation to the blood to try and keep the oxygenation going to the circulation until we can get the heart restarted. There's been two trials that are worth commenting on. The ARREST trial um, was published in The Lancet. Uh, this was a trial in uh, Minneapolis, which uh, enrolled only 30 patients. And after 30 patients, it was stopped because they showed benefit of eCPR. This was a very specific center, very well set up for eCPR um, and showed some very good results, but very small numbers. Uh, last year in JAMA, the Prague uh, trial, after hospital cardiac arrest trial, looked at 260 patients. They didn't show um, any survival benefit, but they showed a better neurological outcome, uh, but that wasn't statistically significant. And this was stopped due to fertility. So there was certainly a signal there in this trial. So Inception, this was published at uh, the beginning of the year in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was looking at early CPR to ECMO CPR for patients with refractory out of hospital cardiac arrest. 10 surgical centers and uh, 12 EMS services in the Netherlands. They had 160 patients. They were comparing eCPR with conventional treatment and their outcome was survival with neuro favorable neurological outcome. Um, obviously, uh, a very good choice of a primary outcome. So what did the results show? eCPR, there were 14 survivors out of uh, 70, 20% so conventional, 16%. So this didn't quite reach significance. There was a signal there, but this was a, a negative trial. But importantly, it didn't show that eCPR patients performed any worse. Um, a few things about this trial, just to mention, it was underpowered. If they'd gone on and uh, recruited the numbers, they may have shown a difference. Um, one in three patients were actually allocated to eCPR, but didn't actually go on and get it. And there's lots of reasons for that, whether, um, for example, the system wasn't able to deliver it that day or something happened to the patient. So not everybody got to it. So again, that may affect the numbers. Um, and very importantly, that the centres involved all had different numbers of patients coming through, different experience, uh, different uh, operator experience, different centre experience. Um, and this is really important with setting up a, um, an intervention such as this, that it has to be very streamlined all the way through from the pre-hospital environment into the ED uh, and very slick, has to be very used to seeing patients and treating them in this way to be able to get some benefit. So summary, uh, this showed that showing benefit in such a complex system is difficult, um, and it's all about the system, not necessarily the um, 
the operator who's doing the ECPAR. It's about the system that you have in place to manage the patient. Uh, importantly, that any benefits that maybe have suggested in the past not disproven, there's certainly no um, evidence that ECPR patients did worse. Um, but further studies are needed to see whether it is reproducible, cost effective, and what needs to be in place in centres to be able to deliver um, a system that, that saves lives. So second cardiac arrest patient uh, uh, paper I'm going to move on to is the DOSE VF study. And this was published again New England Journal just at the end of last year. So just squeezes into my 12 month uh, um, uh, time frame. And this is talking about um, double sequential external defibrillation, which I'm sure some of you have heard about over the last few months. Um, and this is essentially where you provide um, uh, two defibrillations to the heart, one through the standard pad placement and one through the AP pad placement. And you deliver these a second or so apart um, in order to try and improve the uh, um, the rate of defibrillation of the heart in patients who are in refractory VF. So this trial compared uh, those sequential external defibrillation with VEX change defibrillation, which is just a, uh, a cool name for just putting AP pads on, and they compared that with standard defibrillation. Um, it's cluster trial in six paramedic services, so a pre-hospital study. They looked at 405 patients with refractory VF, and they compared, as I said, the three different strategies. And they were looking at, again, a uh, very important outcome, survival to hospital discharge. So something that really affects patients. So what did the results show? So for the uh, dose sequential, there was a 30% survival to hospital discharge. The vector change, 21%, and that all compared to 13% in the conventional one. So this was a, um, a positive trial. Both the uh, dose sequential and the vector change showed significance. And when we look at uh, neurological outcomes, so that's what the ranking, the modified ranking measures, we want good uh, neurological survival and that showed that with the uh, the sequential defibrillation there was a significance the vector change was better but it didn't reach significance so this is a real uh, important paper that suggests that giving dose sequential uh, external defibrillation for refractory vf um, may well be uh, more likely to lead to a patient leaving hospital now a few things just to mention here about this um, it's difficult to do if you've not done it before. So don't just go straight in and start to giving uh, a, a dose sequential, dual sequential um, uh, external defibrillation. Uh, it's important that the defibrillators are the same model. It's important that the pads don't touch. And it's important you don't give the uh, uh, defibrillation together because there's a risk that the current from one defibrillator can go through uh, into the pads of the other one into the machine and can damage your machine. Um, so uh, you don't want to be losing lots of defibs because you're doing this. Um, so they, the pads need to be separate and they can't be given simultaneously. There has to be uh, a, a gap and it's, it's no more than a second. Um, and you need to train as a team, otherwise you'll start defibrillating yourself. So you need to train how to do this, run through it before you get a patient in. So everyone in the team knows what they're doing and is happy delivering uh, the uh, sequential defibrillation. Um, I'm sure there'll be more papers on this uh, in the next year or so and some more research. I think what's likely to happen is we'll see a change in defibrillators so that they are able to, to uh, um, administer simultaneous defibrillation using both PAPLA placements at the same time. Um, and I'm sure there'll be more trials on that, but I suspect this is uh, going forwards, um, something we'll see. And we're certainly using this on uh, uh, patients in our emergency department um, on occasions. I'm going to move from cardiac arrest to sepsis. You're in the recess room again. You've got a 50 year old male who's got a kind of cough and fever for four days. He's got left sided crackles. He's febrile. Chest x ray shows consolidation. You diagnose community acquired pneumonia. You give a litre of fluid, the blood pressure was 80 systolic, and it's not improving. And uh, your registrar says, now, do you think we should use a uh, restrictive fluid strategy here? So less fluid and start some vasopressors early, or should we give many more fluids and uh, hold off uh, vasopressor use? Uh, and which of these will result in lower mortality? 
well, there's a trial for that, and that's the Clovers trial. Uh, now, this uh, was um, published at the beginning of the year, and this compared a strategy of giving early vasopressors and peripherally, if required, um, versus uh, a strategy of just continually giving fluids uh, as you feel the patient needs them. Multicenter, 60 US centers. This was patients who had confirmed or suspected infection who were hypotensive. And the intervention was an uh, early trial of norepinephrine uh, nor, um, and the control arm was a liberal fluid strategy. And the outcome, sl slightly strange, right? It's death before discharged home by day 90. So um, basically um, a inpatient uh, uh, death uh, at 90 days. So what did the results show? So in the restrictive group with restrictive fluids and early vasopressors, there was a 14% mortality. And in the liberal group, so not going for vasopressors early um, and uh, continuing to give further fluids, it's 14.9. So there wasn't any difference shown here, which is important. Um, however, there was no excess mortality. So both strategies seem to result in the same outcome, certainly with this study. This is the only one really that's that looked at this in these type of early patients. There's lots of critical care studies, but not a lot in the pre-hospital and emergency department environment. So I think the take home message here is that we should probably continue what we're doing. And if as a clinician, we think the patient needs uh, further fluid, um, their fluid deplete, they're dry, then we should continue to give fluids. If we get to the point where we feel that they're well filled and the blood pressure is, is not improving, then we should probably reach for vasopressors um, and we should carry on using that strategy. Um, there'll be some of us who reach for vasopressors early and some who um, continue with, low, uh, with more fluid, um, but both approaches seem to be safe. Um, now, there is a study going on in the UK, which some of you may be involved with, the EVIS trial, which is recruiting in 60 UK EDs, which is looking at a similar question, peripheral vaso, uh, pressors, um, uh versus uh, liberal fluid. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll have a, a UK answer to this, uh, this question as well. So a similar theme uh, uh, of infection, we're going to move on to pneumonia. You all know about the recovery trial for covid which showed that uh, uh, steroids were beneficial uh, for patients with uh, COVID who uh, had an oxygen requirement. And um, uh, the question is, is then obviously follows on, should we be using for steroids uh, for patients who've got community acquired pneumonia? Now, uh, this is not something that's uh, common practice. Um, there has been previous meta-analyses that have suggested there may be some benefits from early steroids, such as we do with COVID, um, but as yet, they are not in any uh, national guidance uh, in the UK or uh, elsewhere. So this is the Cape Cod study. This was a double blind, so the patient and the clinician didn't know uh, which group the patient was in, so there'll be a placebo, placebo drug. It was a French study in 31 centres. Um, and importantly here, these are patients who admitted to intensive care and they were either given an infusion of hydrocortisone or placebo. And the uh, investigators were looking at a 28-day mortality here. So in the steroid group, the, uh, the mortality was 6.2 and in the control group, it was 11.9. So this showed uh, a huge uh, uh, benefit for steroids uh, in mortality if given early in community acquired pneumonia. Now, uh, this was only published a few months ago, um, but uh, is probably at the moment not going to immediately change our practice. There's a few reasons for that. Um, the study also showed that if a patient hadn't been intubated, but was going to critical care, then if they got this uh, hydrocortisone, then they were less likely to go on and need intubation as well. So the signal was going the right way there as well. Um, the problem here with this particular trial is that it was all within critical care. 
So there were certainly benefits showed in those patients, but uh, how can we, how far can we uh, extrapolate that to the emergency department? Um, now, normally, if we find a, a difference in critical care, then uh, there's a benefit in treating the patient early. So we would expect that that benefit uh, continues to the emergency department. Uh, but another thing that limits the, the generalised benefit of this study is that the hydrocortisone was given as a 24-hour continuous infusion. So that's, that's obviously much harder to deliver in the ED. So in summary, uh, this trial showed that in patients with severe community acquired pneumonia who are going to intensive care, then hydrocortisone started intensive care reduced mortality. So I think we'll start to see this uh, uh, being adopted in critical care. Um, I suspect it won't yet be adopted in emergency pumps until we see some more trials. So I'm going to finish with uh, three trials on trauma. And the first one we're going to talk about is uh, around the procedure called REBOA. And this is uh, stands for Resuscitative Endovascular Balloon Occlusion of the Aorta. And the uh, the idea behind this technique is that it's for patients who are in trauma, who have a uh, lower limb, uh, or mainly abdominal and pelvic bleeding, uh, which uh, will need definitive hemorrhage control. And what this procedure does, it buys us some time uh, in order to try and reduce hemorrhage uh, and try and improve uh, perfusion above the area of the bleeding. So in the, the proximal area, uh, uh, the areas of the body supplied by the proximal aorta um, in order to buy us a bit of time to get the patient to theatre. And the way this is done is that a cannula is paced uh, up uh, through the femoral artery, um, as you would put in a, a, a femoral arterial line, uh, a bigger catheter that goes up with a balloon that goes up into the aorta, uh, inflates in the aorta to try and reduce bleeding in the uh, abdomen and pelvis, and also the increase uh, the perfusion pressure uh, around the arch and ascending aorta to obviously the brain and uh, the coronary arteries. Now this, uh, there have been several case reports uh, in London uh, trauma service of patients who have had this procedure um, and have survived. Um, and that has been put down to them having this procedure, which has bought the time pre uh to get them to definitive airway control. Sorry, um, hemorrhage control. Um, this study uh, specifically looks at uh, emergency department management rather than pre-hospital care and was based in the emergency department. Now, this study hasn't been published, but was presented at Critical Care Reviews uh, this year, uh, which is an absolutely excellent conference. If you've not heard of it, it's uh, based in Belfast at the Titanic um, and is now uh, one of the leading conferences for critical care and resuscitation, uh, pre-hospital uh, and trauma trials to be uh, released and presented for the first time. And that always happens around about July of the year. Certainly want to keep an eye out because there's some big trials that are discussed at it. And this year, uh, the UK Reboa trial was presented. So this was the first randomised control of the device uh, at all, anywhere, and it was in 16 major trauma centres uh, in England, and they recruited 120 patients who uh, were thought to have exsanguinating hemorrhage. And the trial compared standard major trauma care uh, along with the Reboa procedure, and the, um, the study team um, compared that to standard care alone. And a uh, very appropriate primary outcome was 90 day mortality. So the result, so the primary outcome being 90 day mortality occurred in 54% of the patients who had Reboa and occurred in 42% of the patients who had standard care. Um, now, because of the difficulty of recruiting large numbers of patients to these type of trials, certainly trauma trials, the, um, the authors very appropriately used something uh, called a Bayesian uh, probability, where they looked at the probability that these results were obtained by chance. Um, and it suggested that uh, they this was a significant result. So there was an 87% chance that these results are not obtained by chance. So uh, this took quite a lot of people by surprise. It was quite perhaps unexpected. But then 
There were some more results presented that showed that not only at 90 days, but at all periods up to 90 days. So the team looked at three hours, six hours, 24 hours, etc. cetera. Um, Reboa increased mortality at all time points. Uh, it increased the deaths uh, that were due to bleeding in an interim analysis. And they also showed that the patients who had the Reboa, who were in the intervention arm, um, had substantially delayed times to actually getting to definitive hemorrhage control. So it was 155 minutes, the OR, the opera, sorry, the uh, uh, Gunnell American, uh, into the operating room uh, or theatre in the Reboa group uh, compared to 65 in the standard group. So why is this? So to summarise, uh, this trial uh, clearly shows that using Reboa leads to worse outcomes in exsanguinating trauma patients. Um, and this is different to the ECMO trials, which showed no difference. Um, and it's important, this is actually doing this procedure and certainly within the context of trial was doing harm to patients. Now, there's obviously concerns that one of the reasons for that is doing the procedure is delaying time to hemorrhage control without benefit, in fact, uh, with uh, worse outcomes. Um, but this may not be entirely related to procedure itself. And going back to uh, the comments I made about the ECMO, there are certainly patients, uh, probably a very small subset of patients, um, who uh, have a type of bleeding, um, who are seen uh, pre-hospital, who may have a procedure pre-hospital, uh, such as Reboa, or come to a centre which is totally set up for Reboa. Um, there's many uh, um, ex much experience of it, it's happening regularly, the uh, the people who are performing it are doing it regularly, and there's uh, excellent um, flow of the patient through the department, through to the operating theatre. Um, everyone knows what they're doing. The system is absolutely set up for that. Um, now, the problem is that that doesn't seem to be the case when it's introduced as part of this trial. There'll be um, 120 cases, and there's, there are almost as many operators who are delivering the Reboa. So um, I think this trial tells us a lot about the fact that it's systems of care that saves lives rather than individual interventions. Uh, Reboa itself isn't a bad uh, procedure, but the question of how it fits in to our trauma management is now a question that we need to ask. Um, and it does show the importance of doing real world pragmatic trials to show what actually happens in the real world when you do this procedure and uh, actually have a look at what happens to patients. So we're going to move on to uh, a second trauma patient, uh, a trauma study. Now, you all know about CRASH, CRASH 2, and uh, CRASH 3, looked at head injuries. And um, we know that TXA, so tranexamic acid, uh, is a ben shows benefit for uh, if given uh, early, within three hours, for patients at risk of bleeding uh, in trauma. And this was obviously the results of CRASH 2, which looked at more than 10,000 patients uh, in um, many centres uh, across the world. Now, we obviously use that standard care in the UK and loads and loads of countries do. Uh, it's still, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, clinicians questioning uh, the role of TXA, certainly uh, over in the States. And point to a few things about the trial that uh, they felt uh, made it not as generalizable. So a lot of the trial centers were low and middle income countries. Um, their patients were followed up for 28 days. There was, um, as you'd expect with an international trial such as of 10,000 patients, there was some incompleteness of follow up. Um, and the effect that was actually shown was quite small, although that's why we give it now to anyone who's at risk of benefit, because we know that um, that all patients benefit, whether they are multi-trauma patients or whether they're patients with lower RSS scores. So because of this, there was another study performed, which was the PATCH trauma study, looking at tranexamic acid uh, in patients who were had severe trauma and were who at risk of acute traumatic coagulopathy. So while we know that TXA benefits everybody who's at risk of bleeding, the authors here wanted to look at particularly the patients uh, who were the severe end of the spectrum. It was double blinded. So again, the patient and the clinician didn't know 
uh, what drug the patient was getting. And this was a study in Australia, New Zealand, and in Germany. And importantly, this was uh, uh, in these countries because these were thought to have advanced trauma systems. So again, would this study then TXA be generalizable to, for example, the States and Canada? There were 1,300 patients uh, who were thought to have severe trauma and they were thought to be at risk of coagulopathy due to trauma. It was initiated pre-hospital and was continued in hospital for eight hours and the outcome looked at, this is quite important, um, a Glasgow outcome scale extended, which is basically looking at neurological outcome at six months. And the authors decided that anyone who had an out, uh, a uh, Glasgow outcome scale extended of five to eight had a favorable neurologic outcome. And those where it was one to four were deemed to have an unfavorable outcome. So what did the results show? So we're looking for good functional outcome. So a GOES score of five or more at six months. In the TX gray group, that was 53.7%. And interestingly, the control group is 53.5%. So it didn't show a significance. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, and just came out a couple of uh, months ago. Now, it's quite a complicated study, and it's worth just spending a couple of minutes just going into a bit more de detail about it. So if we look at death, so death within 24 hours, TXA saves lives. So TXA rate was 9.7, control was 14, significant. If we look at death at 28 days, TXA group 17%, control group 21%, significant. So TXA saves lives at 28 days. So what we're seeing here is that there is a definite survival benefit of TXA, but that uh, the patients who survive uh, don't fall into the favorable neurological outcomes. And this is essentially uh, very similar to what was found in CRASH. So it very much supports the findings of uh, CRASH-2 that pre-hospital TXA um, does seem to reduce death and especially death due to hemorrhage. Importantly, um, certainly with some TXA studies, there's been some questions raised about thrombosis, although it's never been shown that the patients getting TXA have a higher risk of thrombosis. So things like HALT-IT and CRASH-2. And again, this study showed that it, this is a very safe drug. So let's put that a bit into perspective. So if you've got 100 patients that you treat with TXA, we know that at six months, there'll be four extra survivors. And of those four extra survivors, one of them will have a, uh, so four of them will have unfavorable outcomes, neurological outcomes, and one of those four will have severe disability. Three of them will have a lower severe disability. So and this raises a, an interesting philosophical question. Uh, so there's no worsening outcome. We don't uh, have more patients uh, um, dying in the TX arm. It's safe. And there are more survivors and there are some patients, those that do survive, do have some disability. So this is something where I suspect there'll be a debate over the next 12 months or so about this. And uh, really, you know, this is where PPI is really important and the patient perspectives really about knowing those patients who had a GOS scores of five and what kind of function outcome these patients had. Um, and uh, for them, you know, that type of survival, uh, TXA has got them to the point where they've survived with a GOS of five. How does that compare to not surviving and the uh, the consequences of that? So I think that the take home that we already knew from CRASH-2 is patch trauma has shown us that TXA is safe and it's effective. It is also effective in advanced major trauma systems and it's also effective, which we also knew in major trauma patients, uh, those more severely injured, and we should continue to use it uh, in patients who've got major trauma, who are at risk of bleeding, the CRASH-2, and coagulopathy, the PATCH trial. So got a couple more minutes left. I'm just going to whiz through this last one. Uh, this is another trauma study, and this is looking at the use of fibrinogen in uh, trauma patients. 
Now, some of you may know that there's been an interest uh, over the last 10 to 15 years um, looking at acute traumatic coagulopathy. We know that uh, patients who have acute tra trauma coagulopathy, so that's a coagulopathy second to trauma, um, have low levels of fibrinogen. And there is some, uh, as a, obviously a hypothesis, that if we replace, replace fibrinogen um, or cryoprecipitate, which is a, a, a plasma product that consists mainly of fibrinogen as well as some other factors, will this improve outcome in trauma? And this was the Cryostat 2 uh, study, again, unpublished uh, in journals, but was presented again at the critical care reviews. And this study was a randomized controlled trial in lots of centers in England, North America, and Australia, looking at the early use of fibrinogen concentrate in patients with major trauma. So these were trauma patients with active bleeding and who were in shock, requiring a major transfusion protocol. And the patients were randomized to get six grams of cryoprecipitate or standard care practice. And the authors looked at mortality at 28 days, which was 25% in the early cryoprecipitate group, 26% in the control group. So uh, no evidence of any signal there that cryoprecipitate itself in this situation improves survival. Um, just mentioned this day of some subgroup analyses that showed perhaps timing is important. And we probably know that uh, sent it from uh, the CRASH-2 trial where we have to give TXA within three hours of the injury. And there was some possible harm in penetrating trauma patients. So again, this, this trial shows that there's no evidence for giving early cryoprecipitate to all patients with major trauma, uh, possibly some worse outcomes, but again, subgroup uh, um, analysis of smaller number of patients. And the take home here, uh, some of you may have heard of the refill trial, which looked at pre-hospital blood versus saline and again showed no difference. Obviously, in all different pre-hospital uh, services, we are using a real uh, uh, continuum, really, of blood products. So some services, a lot of services are using um, uh, packed red cells. Uh, some are using cryoprecipitate. Some are use, uh, using sort of powdered uh, uh, freeze-dried um, fibrinogen product um, and some are using whole whole blood as well and you'll know there's a, there's a trial as well going across the UK um, looking at whole blood um, and I think this probably just shows us that uh, empirically just treating every patient with the same treatment whether that's cryoprecipitate whole blood packed red cells um, probably not going to show any in any benefit overall and we probably need some mechanism for knowing a bit more about the patients in terms of what their coagulation is like to direct their plasma products, or their, their products, their blood products, much more specifically, how far they are from hospital, um, how far they are from definitive major con um, hemorrhage control, whether they're rural or whether they're, they're city-based trauma. And I think all of these things will tie in uh, over the next few years and we'll have a more precision um, personalised medicine approach which will use maybe point of care testing to aid us about which products are better in which particular patients. So as we know, trauma is not one disease. Uh, it's made up of a whole different things um, and we'll probably need to get down to um, much more specifics about individual patients to be able to work out which blood products uh, they'll benefit and when the best time to give them is. So uh, that's me finished. So just to summarize, uh, as I said, a uh, great year for resuscitation and critical care research. Uh, the take homes are that it doesn't matter if you use a video or direct laryngoscopy. If you're inexperienced, go with the video laryngoscopy. If you've got experience, probably doesn't matter. eCPR is likely to become established. I would have thought over the next five to 10 years, but we need the right system to embed it in. Um, Dual sequential external defibrillation is probably coming to a pre-hospital ED arena near you over the next day, a few years. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if, it's, uh, if it uh, comes across in the next ALS guidelines. There is no evidence that a restrictive uh, with early vasopressors, uh, early um, uh, nor adrenaline, uh, uh, potentially peripherally, or an approach where we give liberal fluids is better in sepsis. 
but it's both approaches are neither worse than each other. Uh, IV steroids may be good in community-acquired pneumonia. Watch this space. Uh, Reboa, probably only effective in highly trained practice settings and occasional patients. Again, more work needed about who those patients are. TXA, safe and effective. We should be definitely using it in all patients, as we do in major trauma who are at risk of coagulopathy and bleeding. And finally, more research is required and is ongoing into which trauma patients may benefit from blood products, including whole blood, packed red cells, fibrinogen content, concentrate and other uh, clotting factors. Thank you very much.